Last week we started out with the, the first principle of, of how, what do we face seeing weeks and victory loss. And that is recognize the source of the problem, recognize the source of the answer. Hallelujah. Uh, we have to understand there is, a, there is a problem, there is a source to the problem, and there is a source to the answer. Satan is the source of your problem. Actually, John 10.10 10 is both the answers to these questions of which one is the pro source of the problem, which one is the answer. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to kill, still and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In the last Sunday night, we talked about be sure that you have the promises of God cover the things you ask for. You cannot ask for things that there's no faith for. Faith, now see, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Meaning that if you don't have Scripture for it, there's no faith for it. Amen. You've got to have Scripture for what you're believing for. <clears throat> Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let me say something. There's, there's people who, who kind of uh, run off on deep ends and tangents and say, well, you know, you know, power of positive confession is trying to make God bend to your will. No, if it's not Bible, it's not a, it can't be positive. And, you know, God said in His Word, He said this. He said, concerning my promises, command ye me. The Hebrew actually says, demand me. And what's that mean? He wants us to speak His Word. We're not trying to make God do something, bend them to our will. When I speak His Word, I'm just, just uh, calling Him in to do what He said He's already going to do. Yeah. I'm lining up with Him. Amen. And He told me to do it. You know, people get real cute and say, well, we don't believe in the power of positive confession because you're trying to make God bend to your will. It, let me say something. If it ain't Bible, you ain't got no need in saying it. Now, some people get flaky and some people do some stuff, but I'm telling you, we don't teach that. We teach that you speak God's Word. You've got to have Scripture that covers the promises you're believing for or the things you're believing for. You've got to find Scripture. Why? Because if you don't have Scripture, there's no faith. Well, what if the Holy Ghost spoke to me? He'll line up with the Scripture. <laughs> if the Holy Ghost is talking to you, it'll be in line with the written Word. Amen. All right. Now, that's, that's, that was last Sunday. You have to go back there. Now, I'm going to get on one this morning. You're not going to say amen to when I say it. Amen. Jeff's already said amen to the fact that he ain't going to say Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the third thing, see, listen, last week we talked about know who the source is, know who the answer is, have Scripture that covers what you're believing God for. Number three, be sure you're not living in sin. Yeah. Now, um, I was reading for Tony Cook last week in one of his uh, posts, and he was quoting some early, uh, somebody else from, from an earlier time, and, and I don't remember who it was. Um, you know, sometimes things are, you know, you can kind of go, well, that was really good, but I don't remember who said it. But he said this, um, one of the biggest tricks of the devil is to try to get the church to believe that sin is not destructive. One of the biggest ch tricks of the church, I mean, that the Satan has against the church, is to try to get the church to believe that sin is not destructive. And, uh, you know, that's, that's dangerous ground. I said, that's dangerous ground. Can you say amen? amen? If you believe that sin is not destructive, you're fooling yourself. Now, I know we're not here to preach and put you in condemnation about sin. Your heart's already done if you're in sin. You're right. Look at first, I mean, look over in um, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. It says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now, <clears throat> I'm saying that if our heart condemn us not. See, the Bible teaches you basically this. If you're in sin, your own heart will condemn God. Well, God doesn't condemn you, but your own heart will. Amen. See, sin is destructive. Sin is a separator. Sin will enter in and keep you from being able to live by faith and do what God has for you to do. Yep. Well, you just don't want us to have fun. You know, I'm, I'm under grace. I'll get to that one. I got a good one for you this morning. Hallelujah. You know, I'm under grace. It don't matter. You know, I'm, I'm, all I do because I got saved, I don't repent. I'm under grace. Do you know what? There's a whole chapter written to you. It's called Romans, the sixth chapter. Amen. There's a whole chapter written about that stuff. We'll get there too. Um, sin, your own heart would condemn you because it, know, it knows it's done wrong. And it's, it, it brings an, in, in, an inhibition between your ability to fellowship with the Father. Well, when, you, when, you, when you're there, you can't live in faith. You can't get into faith when you're in sin because it just short-circuits stuff. 
Hello? Mm -hmm. Sin will short circuit your walk with God. Yeah. On your end. Well, we just don't need to, we, need, we don't need to condemn people. We need to teach people that the righteousness of God. That, no, no, no. We need to teach people when they sin, repent. That's right. <laughs> because they are the righteousness of God in Christ. And get things right. Not go, not just kind of put salve. Let me tell you something. How many know this? <clears throat> you know, if, let's say if you cut yourself and you just put a Band-Aid on it. It'll still get infected under that Band-Aid. You might keep dirt and stuff out of it, but it's still going to get infected. What do you got to do? You got to put something on that to help kill the infection so it'll get healed up. And if there's an infection in the wound, it won't heal infected. The infection will inhibit the healing process. Sin is like an infection in your heart. You know, when, you, when you're trying to get right with God, it inhibits that restoration process. It's an inhibitor. And it won't allow you to walk free. And, you know, how many of you have ever had something you just didn't take care of like you should? You didn't put Neosporin on it. You didn't do whatever. And uh, you may put a band on Well, that's, that's a patch. That's a patch. <clears throat> because the infection is going to keep, it won't heal up until you get rid of the infection in it. It'll just sit there and stay inflamed and swollen and won't heal. That's what sin will do in your life. And people want to come along and use grace. Now, listen, I'm not talking about all grace, but I'm talking about some of the stuff people are preaching now. They want to take grace and just put it on there as a bandit and not deal with the infection that's there. And the person, their own heart's condemning them. And you come, oh, you don't need to repent. Just declare you're the righteousness of God in Christ. It doesn't matter what you did because you're under grace. You know, all you've done is put a bandit on it. And they're going to sit there sore, and they're going to sit there not healing up. They're not going to be getting right when all they've got to do is put, on, put the blood of Jesus on it and confess it and let him forgive them. And then you can put the band-aid on it of grace and let it heal up. Let, it be, let the restoration take place. Amen. Instead of trying to convince them. that, but I don't know Why do you want to convince people not to do what the Bible says? Oh, yeah. Hello. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Thank God. He didn't say if we sin, don't worry about it. He didn't say if we, if we sin, just act like it didn't happen. He says we have an advocate with the Father. What is it? He's, he's the one who argues our case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I've got a court-appointed attorney who will go in before the Father and argue on my behalf God. if I sin. We're going to get there. All right. In Genesis, the third chapter, we know from Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, um, the, and, you know, the eyes of the, I don't want to read all that because it's, it's, it's just, it's the fall of Adam and uh, Eve in the garden. <clears throat> they knew they were naked when sin took place in life. They were born again from life unto death. Hallelujah. Uh, well, that's really not a hallelujah. That's a um, bad hallelujah. Anyway, I don't know if that's a word or not. I don't know if that works real good or not. But the fall of man took place in the Garden of Eden. There had to be a Redeemer. Jesus came as our Redeemer. We know that. We've been born again. If you're born again, you pass from death into life. The nature of the Father dwells you. But you can still sin. You can still commit acts of sin. And those sins, those acts of sin, will inhibit you from your, and, 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 and short circuit and derail your walk with God. Now, people don't like to hear this. They want to hear, I'm under grace. It doesn't matter. We don't talk about sin because all I do is I have to look at the finished work of Jesus. Well, <clears throat> if I'm looking at the finished work of Jesus, what am, I what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to look at the finished work of Jesus and say, he went to the cross and took my sin nature, but he also now is my advocate where he makes intercession for me. And when I do sin, I can go to him. And he'll argue my case based on his blood and have forgiveness applied to me because of what I did. And I can be right, restored back into my right fellowship with the Father. You know this in relationships with people. Now, I'm just going to give you one that, that probably everybody in this room has experienced at some point in time in their life. You're sitting somewhere talking about somebody. I ain't talking about good talking. I'm talking, you're talking about somebody. And then when you're in a you're a cup, coffee shop, you're at the, the uh, Cracker Barrel, you're somewhere, and in they walk. And you're, you're going to go ahead and say, hey, but something on the inside of you, something on you kind of, you, you feel guilty. They don't even know it. It hasn't affected their, their attitude towards you at all. But you know it. Mm -hmm. And you feel guilty. Why? Because you sinned against them, even though they don't know it. Now, in God's case, he knows what you've done. But it didn't affect his attitude towards you. It affected yours in his presence. Yeah, right. It's got to be dealt with. Yeah. It's got to be cleansed and be removed. 
You won't be able to walk up and say, oh, how good to see you, love you, how you doing, glory to God. Because if, even if you're doing that, the whole time you're thinking, boy, I sure hope they didn't hear what we were saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know by the lack of amens and the hallelujahs and all that, there's some guilty folk this morning. <laughs> Some of you been there, done that, and burned the t-shirt. All right. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. For he that will love life and see good days. How many want to love life and see good days? Three of you. Anybody else want to see, live, love life? How about, how about who wants to see good days? Sure. Oh, that's, that's getting better. Hallelujah. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. He did not say let him just recognize that he's under grace and he don't have to do anything. He said you are to eschew evil and do good. See, people who teach that there is no responsibility of the believer to do anything are doing you a disservice when you hear them and you act on what they say. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Not issue, but issue, ensue it. Hallelujah. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, if I'm a born again believer, I don't want his face against me. Hallelujah. Are you here? You're gone home. One person said they're here. Amen. Who's here? here. Who doesn't know? My son doesn't know if he's here or not. I mean, you can tell the, the, the anointing from singing the song to, he don't even know if he's here sitting in the room. All right. Let's get to Romans, the sixth chapter. If you're going to love life and see good days, you're going to have to eschew evil and do good. Amen? You're going to have to um, have your tongue, keep your tongue from evil. Your lips will speak no guile. You're going to have to seek peace. There are things you're required to do as a believer. I know one group of people said they don't read Peter, James, and John in the New Testament because they don't, they don't agree with Paul, and Paul has the revelation of grace, so you don't need to do anything but read Paul's writings. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. You need to read all, read all the authors of the Bible. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. And anybody, if you hear somebody say that, slap them and run. <laughs> say, act like Brown. The devil's a lie. The devil's a lie. The devil's a lie. How many, how many of you have ever seen Tyler Perry's Meet the Browns? Yeah. Brown. Brown's always, the devil's a lie. Hallelujah. Romans, is, we're going to read the entire. They say the entire sixth chapter. Then we'll come back and read the boat. I got three people who hooked up with me this morning. If you don't get it, we're going to do the hokey pokey. And I'm going to bring you up front and make you do it while I sit down and film it for the internet. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin should be destroyed, for that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead. Now the Greeks says here, the, uh, Weymouth in his study notes on this particular phrase, he that is dead, says the ART really says, he that is um, the, he that has died. In other words, you died when you, uh, you died to the old self, you were raised in newness of life. You're not dead. Okay? He said he has, he has died. In other words, you came to Christ, you died to that old way. But you are not dead to its ability to resurrect if you allow it. Mm -hmm. Those passions in your flesh can be raised up, and we'll get to that. See, we, get, see some things, we, we, we took some things that concerning positional truth of being in Christ and being seated with Him in heavenly places and applied them to the natural life to a degree that they became er erroneous. Uh -huh. We got people believing that, you know, I can't sin no matter what. 
it's impossible for me to see him because I'm under grace. Oh, somebody was out living with their girlfriend and fornicating, and they said, oh, that doesn't matter, I'm under grace. Well, it does matter. It's, 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 it's destructive. Are y'all here? Yeah. All right. It does matter. He that, uh, that has died is free from sin. Now, if we be dead, same thing here, same tense in the verb. Hey, if we, if we uh, have died with Christ, we believe also that we shall live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead or have, to have died unto sin. Ooh, reckon. If you have to reckon something, it means it's still hanging around. And if you don't deal with it, it'll overtake you. Uh, that goes against my righteousness teaching. You better go back and study your righteousness teaching properly. We, we, people taught some stuff. They said Dad Hagen and those guys taught that they didn't teach. Hello? Thank you for your enthusiasm. All right. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto, in, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We, ha <coughs> we have to do something about it. We have to say, no, I, I, I died to that. It no longer has dominion over me. We have, to, we have to actively be against those things. Amen? Hallelujah. Listen to this. Verse 12. Let not. Does that sound like action? Or resting. I just look at the finished work. Of, he said, let not. Don't let anybody in. I'm going to lay on here in the front row and just trust the alarm system. Hello? The alarm system went off. Okay. If I am charged with the response, listen, can you imagine a Marine being at the embassy, at the gate? And they said, don't you let anybody through that gate. And he says, well, the gate's there. I'm resting in the power of the gate. And he goes and sits down. He's got his weapon with him. You know, put on the whole armor of God. Why well, you got that armor? You're supposed to do something with it. Amen. Don't let anybody through that gate, Marine. And he sits down and says, well, the gate's there. The power of the gate will keep them out. <laughs> no. They knew the gate was there when they told him, let not. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. God, God knew that his grace was there when he said, let not. And somebody comes to that gate, and they start shaking on that gate, and they start putting little charges on the hinges so they can blow the gate and come in. And that Marine says, well, the alarm system, I'm under the alarm system. The power of the gate is going to keep them out. And they blow the gate and start coming in, and then the sergeant comes and gets them later, I mean, you know, and gets in that, that, that you know, uh, private first class of space, who's now reduced to the rank of boot camp. <clears throat> heading to Leavenworth. Hallelujah. Are you here? And says, why did you stop him? I was resting in the power of the gate. The gate was there. It was to keep them out. And I just looked at the finished work of the guys who constructed the gate and said, that's enough. Marine, I told you to not let anybody through that gate. That meant he had to take action. And if they blew that hinges on that gate, he was to unload his weapon in them as they came through it. Are you here? The Bible says, let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body. You've got to, listen, you, you, we are under grace. I understand we're under grace. But you have got a responsibility to stand guard at the gate and not let stuff into your life that's going to cause destruction. Let not sin therefore, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Church, stop listening to these yin yang yo yo brains who are telling you it doesn't matter what you do, it is destructive to you, it will hurt you, it will, it will bring misery to your life eventually. It'll bring destruction to your life. Now, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to tell you, if you want to walk with God, if you want to see good days, amen? Yeah, yeah. Hello, are you here? If you, if you want to love life and see good days, you're going to have to refrain from stuff. And you're going to have to say no to stuff. And you're going to have to stand at the gate. Grace may be the gate, but if you open the door, let the enemy come in and don't do anything about it, he'll run over your life. All right. 
you've been charged by the Word of God, by the Apostle Paul, the preacher of grace, as it were. You've been charged by him to let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. That means it can. Yeah, right. <clears throat> it, can be, it can be in your mortal body. Hello? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. What? That you should obey it and the lust thereof. God doesn't want you obeying sin for lust. Mm -hmm. Are y'all here? Mm -hmm. yes. Don't want you shooting up, smoking dope, getting drunk. Hello? I'm free to drink all I want to drink. We'll get to that. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I, I don't really think so. Jesse posted a real interesting post yesterday. You know, all the Europeans say that it's a cultural thing that they can drink over in Europe and all that kind of stuff. You know, you can be a Christian and drink. It's just a cultural thing in America. We don't. Did you know that they have the highest rate of alcohol-related deaths in Europe than anywhere else in the world? And people between 15, 15 years and older drink at least 60 grams of alcohol at each uh, episodic drinking session. That means when they sit down to drink, they drink at least 60 grams of alcohol. And they had the highest related diseases and deaths attributed to alcohol of anywhere else on the planet. But it's cultural. I think that might be a weak argument. Hello? That went over big. Y'all here? You're going home. Now, let's go on. Get back down here. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey the lust thereof. Neither, listen, neither yield ye your members... As in, why is Paul telling us not to yield our members? Because we can. Oh no, I'm under grace. It don't, Paul said, don't do it. If you can, if you would not be instructed not to yield your members if you couldn't. God don't put stuff in the Bible just to take up space. God doesn't give us instructions just because he didn't have anything else to do that day. There's enough going on in our life without unnecessary commandments in the Word of God. Hello? Without redundant scriptures that, mean, that are meaningless since they don't apply to us anymore. I have no value to us at all. Well, the pastor of the Old Testament don't apply to us, and they were written for our examples. Right. All that stuff was written as an example to you. Go think about Israel. Every time they worshiped and kept their, their lives clean before the Lord and, and had a heart for God, things went well for them. The minute they started chasing after other gods and got into sin, well, things went bad for them. That was written as an example to you. Right. It's not there just to give us history. The Bible says they were, the things concerning Israel were written. The King James uses the word in samples. Basically means example. They were written as an example to us, not to the unbelievers, to the church. So what does that tell me? That tells me when I look at the, Israel's existence and how they did things, I can learn from them what to and what not to do so that I don't get, so I can either get the results that I want or not get the results that I don't want. And when they, when they went a-whoring after other gods, and they got into sin, and they started rejecting the commandments of God, they got into trouble. Yeah. And it brought curse on them. But when they turned from those things and tore down the groves and turned their hearts toward God, good things happened to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was written as an example to us. Yeah. We just can't throw that out. Well, that's Old Testament. No, but it was written as an example. The New Testament said, it's an example for you. Uh-huh. Yeah. What's that mean? Listen to it. Learn from it. Learn, Vern. Amen. You take a hint. There's something in there for you. We don't like, people don't like to hear that kind of stuff. They don't want to hear, you know, any responsibility. I'm telling you, this, this lack of responsibility is of the devil. It's a worldly mindset. It did not come from God. Right. It's a good place to say amen. Amen. Yeah. Think of, think of what's going on in our, in our world, in our country. Nobody's responsible anymore. My actions aren't, I'm not responsible for my actions. I'm not responsible for anything I do. That's a godless, antichrist mindset. And it's entered into the church. They call, and people have used a message that is pure and beautiful and wonderful from the Bible and perverted it. And the Bible says in Jude that people entered in and, and perverted 
the message of grace, turning the grace of God into licentiousness and lasciviousness. They turned the grace of God into something that it wasn't. In, they did it back in Jews' day. Wow, same devil's running around. I said the same devil's running around. All right. <clears throat> so, we have to understand that, that, that these things are destructive to us. They hurt us. They harm us. They, they, bring, they bring bad things into our life. Hello? They mess up things. Amen. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin... But yield ye yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not hand dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You see people jumping in and take that one scripture out of place and go run off with it. What then? See, Paul, Paul brought balance right back to it, because he knew people would say this. They leave this out. Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid them. Amen. Know ye not, he makes it clear, know ye not that to whom you yield your servants, yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether a sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Ooh, there's an obedience word in there. People don't like to hear obedience anymore. We used to sing songs, trust and obey, for there's no other way. No, 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 I forgot how it went from there. Huh? To be, happy to be happy in Jesus, there's no other way. Remember, to trust and obey. Obey. You know, if you're really going to be obedient, you'll eat the good. That's Old Testament. I just love it how they always want to throw out stuff as Old Testament when they don't like it. Unless we got New Testament scriptures that supersede the Old Testament, it's still a good principle. Now, Jesus said, you know, I, you've seen that it was written eye for eye and tooth for tooth. I say unto you, do good then to see. We have a law. We have a Jesus teaching us there's something that supersedes that one. But I say unto you, do good then to despitefully use you. Amen? He taught in love. So we have to understand that not everything in the Old Testament is thrown out. Only when they're superseding authority from the New Testament do we not do it anymore. Jesus said, you know, for the writing, only for because of the hardness of your heart did God give you, Moses give you the writing of divorcement. Amen? He said the reason was the hardness of our hearts. People were getting divorced because they weren't hard, they're hard hearted. They're hard hearted. They wouldn't, they wouldn't listen to God. They wouldn't, and I'm talking about both parties. You know, they're, they're, we know that you can have irreconcilable differences. You'd have people who were just full of the devil. I mean, they can be full of the devil. Law. That woman is full of the devil. Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so Paul says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were servant, that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men. Because of the infirmity of your flesh, for you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, to unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and to holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then of those things wherever you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, you became the servants of right of God to God. You have fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. There's, there's a particular passage in here that says some things are really good. Hallelujah. And I'm, um, hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me get here. See, Romans, the sixth chapter. <laughs> Glory to God. I was, I was reading this in, in my office this morning before I came out, and um, there we go, there we go. It's in Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were once enthralled unto sin, you have now yielded a hearty obedience 
to that system of truth which you have been instructed. Now, King James says, but thanks be to God that you were, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart uh, that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. And that makes it sound like, like some people teach. You've obeyed us all over. Now, all, everything that he's been saying is not true. But, but Weymouth says here, <coughs> again, referring to the Greek, and he says, where it says, have yielded or have, um, have obeyed, he says literally and better and more exactly because of the tense of the verb, it is have begun to obey or yield. See, this is the thing we have to understand. We're growing in God. Now, when you got born again, you became a child of God. Your spirit is born of God. There is no more, um, you know, Satan no longer has the right to rule and reign over you unless you let him. You're not born again a complete, full-grown spiritual Christian, but you are born again a complete, born again new creation that needs to grow up. Amen. We were once the servants of sin, and now we have begun to yield to the doctrine of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. We have begun. I'm sorry we can't put that up for you. We don't have it. We'll have it next week, I guess, or sometime soon. Having, we have, see, we says in, in, in not we, Weymouth. Weymouth says in the Greek, the, the, the ART's form verb here is, is not that it's a past tense, you have yielded or you have, you know, obeyed fully. You have begun to obey. This is where we get into trouble sometimes when people take stuff and they don't, and they don't study out a little, just a, just a little extra uh -huh. right. and run out and teach. And listen, people, people who want to present something won't study out the little extra because they might find something that will derail their position. If you're uh, studying to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, you better find out for the, for the fact if it's fully what the Word of God says before you go out and start preaching it and teaching it, and then you get yourself at a corner and you can't back out because you're selling too many books on too many television programs and got too many people coming to your church because you're preaching stuff that ain't right. And you're not willing to back off. Uh, you know, there's a, well, preachers wouldn't do that. Dad Hagen told the story about one guy a number of years ago. And he was ministering in his church. And, and um, he was dealing with some stuff. And, and his wife, you know, and, and that day, Dad would stay a lot of times in the people's houses. And um, he, he was, he was, you know, that's how they did it back then. We, you know, nowadays, everybody wants to be in the hotel because they want to stay in people's houses because, you know, they got dogs, they got cats or whatever. You know, so people don't keep as clean as whatever. And, you know, but back in those days, people were more accustomed to traveling and staying in the, in, in the pastor's homes when they were a traveling minister. And, um, you know, and, and this, you know, the wife would cook breakfast and that brother Hagen was there eating breakfast. And she said, she said, you need to get my husband to come to your morning meetings. He said, well, I've talked to him several times about coming. And he won't come. She said, he needs to hear what you got to say. He says, I know it, I know it. Um, he said, but I've tried, she said, but I'll try again. So that minister got, you know, came into there after they had their conversation. He came and sat down and eat breakfast and, and they got to sit and kind of just chit chatting. And he said, you know, so I so said, you need to come to these morning services. He said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, but, but I got to do the television program. He said, and, and this and that, and the other day, and just sort of listening on things he had to do that kept him from being there for that morning service where dad was teaching on faith. And listen to this. Dad finally just got frustrated with him. He said, don't you know you're going to die? He said, yeah, I know it. But I'd have to, if I come, I'd have to admit that you're right and I'm wrong and I'd rather die than do that. Well, okay. <laughs> don't you, you see, people's pride will keep, will keep them teaching stuff they know is wrong just because they don't want to admit they're wrong. Yeah. There are people preaching stuff that they know is wrong because either it's, it's too much money coming in from the ministry because of it. They don't want to admit their own pride goes before destruction, the Holy Spirit before the fall. Dad, Dad said, I'm closing the meeting down this week. Went to the next church because of how he did it back in those days was when he finished the meeting, he called the next pastor and said, I said, I'm coming to you next. Can we start Sunday? And they'd say, yeah, and he'd go to that next church. That's how he did it. In those. Now, now you, some people booked up two or three years in advance, you know, and, and if God wanted them to go somewhere, they, they, they'd, have to, they'd have to nuke Hawaii to be able to do it. I mean, you just, you just can't do it because the way people do stuff. And he got to that church. He said, now, I was just over so-and-so's church. He'll fall dead in his pulpit two weeks from Sunday. See, when you're a prophet, you, hear, you see things in the Spirit. Yeah. They got a call two weeks. He was in that other church at the time. He said, because he could do two, three, four, five-week meetings. He was in that two weeks, and that Sunday got a phone call. So-and-so just fell dead in his pulpit. And it wasn't him that caused him to die. He said, I'd rather die than admit I'm wrong. 
Now, I said that, I'll say this. There are people preaching stuff on television, writing books, and doing whatever, and they know they're wrong. And they'll keep doing it because they've got too many people coming in the building. They've got too many royalties coming off the books. They've they got too many churches to go preach in. And if they, if they change what they're saying, they won't let them come in. Because everybody wants to hear the fluff and the puff. I want to hear what they say of the Spirit of God. And if I don't like it in my flesh, my flesh is just going to have to change. I, I need adjustments. I need the Spirit of God yielded, yielded to the Holy Ghost. Amen? And listen, nobody wants to teach on sin. I can't get a big crowd in the charismatic word of faith grace circles right now teaching on sin. Because they want to hear that I'm under grace and it don't matter. They want their ears tickled. But you know what? The Bible talks about people who heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Folks, don't yield yourselves. You have begun to obey, but don't think the fact that you've begun to yield or begun to obey from the heart that that has established you in a place that it doesn't matter what you do. It will always matter what you do. It will always matter what you do. There's never going to be a time that it doesn't. Even in heaven, it will matter what you do. Don't you know that after a thousand year, year millennial reign of Christ, that Satan will be loosed to deceive the nations? And I, I honestly believe there are going to be people who are deceived when he's loosed. Put away those Nerf darts. And really put away the real ones for sure. I don't want to get hit in the back on the way out the door this morning. Hello? It matters what we do in heaven. It matters what we do on the earth. It matters what we do with our flesh. It matters what we do with our thinking. He that looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery in his heart already. Woo! But I didn't do it. Jesus said you did it already. Uh -huh. How about that? <laughs> you got to control your thought life. Yeah, right. There you go. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Just your thoughts. Listen, we're not just told to control our flesh. We're to control our thoughts. Yeah. My God, if God expects you to control your thoughts, I know doggone well he expects you to control your flesh. <laughs> Come on. He said, just thinking about it. You've done it. Now, you don't, may not have the natural consequences of your thoughts, but you're still getting the spiritual consequences of your thoughts. And then you think about it for 30 seconds. The answer is obey God. Amen. He tells us not to yield. Because if you, obey, if you yield, then you become the servant of sin. God does not want you serving sin. Why? Because it's destructive to you. It's destructive to people around you. It hurts. Well, I love the Lord, but I'm smoking dope all the time. That's destructive. Well, I, I can love the Lord and be drunk. It's destructive. I can look at pornography on the Internet. Nobody else knows it. Yeah, but Jesus said, you've already thought about it. You've done it. And there ain't no need looking at it if you ain't thinking about it. Because the only reason you're looking at it is because you're thinking about it. That went ever big. Don't, we don't want to talk about those things. And then we say, we ain't just talking to men anymore. Now they're saying that there's been a rise in women viewing pornography. They're, they're catching up. Sad to say.
Can I get a witness? Yeah, I don't want to hear about it, do you? No. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. Verse 17, but I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> but thanks be to God that though you were once in the thrall of sin, you have begun to yield a hearty obedience to that system of truth in which you were instructed. You were set free. And being, when, you, when you yield, the more you yield, the more free you are. <clears throat> See, what people want to come in and say, here's the, here's the lie the devil's told. If we tell you not to sin, you're putting people into captivity. And the truth of the matter is, when you liberate them to sin, you put them into captivity. Because who they yield their members to, they become their servants. What I say is, yes, we trust Jesus. We trust the grace, the empowering grace, and the strengthening grace in us to empower us to overcome sin, but I still have to overcome it, and I have to put it down, and I have to not yield to it, and I have to yield to God, and I have to obey God, and that is liberty. Because I want to tell you something. With the Spirit of the Lord there is, there is liberty. He may walk with you and he may abide with you, but I'm telling you, there is not that presence of the, where the Spirit, where, uh, referencing where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom. The more you walk with him, the closer you walk with him. Draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto thee, says the Lord. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a New Testament scripture, folks. You gain more freedom in your life the further you walk away from the things of the world and the closer you walk with God in your heart. And the closer you get to the things of the world, the more captivity, the more bondage you're in. So these yingle-yangle, money-grubbing dogs, and that's all they are, I'm sorry, because they get big churches and big crowds who tell you it doesn't matter what you do, you can keep doing it because you're under grace, are bringing you in to captivity. Yeah. to sin because they're empowering you to yield your members as servants of unrighteousness instead of servants of righteousness and know ye not that to whomever you yield your members they are who you serve that's why you can't have sin in your life I want to walk the walk of faith. I want to walk the walk of, of walking in the Spirit. I want to have the walk of obeying God and pleasing God and honoring God. I want to be as close to Him and as far away from the things of the world as I can get. I just had to be a fruitcake. I don't have to, you know, you don't have to wear, you know, I mean, some people get into, you know, where you got to wear long sleeve shirts and you can't ever, women can't ever cut their hair and the dress has got to be down. I ain't talking about that. But I'm going to tell you something else, women. If you can't bend over, with your Donald Duck dress on. That's what my daddy used to call him. Up to your quack. <laughs> my sister come out, he go, you got that Donald Duck dress on again. She said, what are you talking about? It's up to your quack. <laughs> if you can't bend over, it's too short. Hello? I'm sorry. And men, I don't want to see you in those silky running shorts with your cheeks hanging out. See them running down the road. Who wants to see that? I'm buff. We don't care. It's easy, and that's just, it's, it's garbage. I ran in gym shorts, that, you know, the longer gym shorts. I used to run in those all the time. It didn't bother me a bit in the world. And I'm not designed for long distance running. I don't have the long, skinny legs. I mean, really, even when, even when I was in my best shape, my legs just too, it didn't work real, it just didn't work real good, but I'd run, but I didn't put on them super shorts like that. And run down the road so everybody could see your, your back end hanging out, your little flippy, gone on talking about clothing. No. Yeah. See, when you walk with God, you're going to be modest in, in all things. This say you've got to be extreme, but you can be modest. I mean, I've got some people in our, in our town, that, that the, girl, the girl, the boys are out in shorts, the girl's always got that long jean skirt on down to her ankles, and it's real tight so she can't hardly walk. 
You know what I'm talking about? You know, the girl, the girl has to, but the guys can wear the shorts. I know that, come on now. <clears throat> but I'm not talking about, you know, that we got to go back to the old beehive, higher dues, no makeup. I'm not talking about, because, you know, Brother Hagin said, old barn needs a little paint. Dad said that. I'm just telling you what he said. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't get that. Hallelujah. Yeah, a little barn needs a little, little paint every now and then. Hallelujah. So, you know, it's okay to wear makeup. Amen. Took, took a passage of Paul and mis, misquoted it. But when you walk with God, you want to have a modesty of, of lifestyle about you. You want to represent Him. You're not trying to act as much like the world. I mean, listen, folks, this, this crazy mess. You know, well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to reach the radical people, and I'm going to get gauges in my ear. You're stupid. You got holes that big in your ears with some weight hanging on it? I'm going to reach those people. Acting like them ain't going to reach them. Jesus ate with publicans and sinners, and he still wore his rabbinical clothing. They weren't interested in his dress. They were interested in what he had. And I'm going to tell you something. You can dress like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, but if you don't have heaven residing in you in overflow, you can't help the world. Yeah. Come on now. You've got to be full of him. And when you're full of him, you don't have to act like them to get to them. Because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke, not your gauge. Hello? Besides, it's going to cost you a lot of money to fix that later on when you decide you don't need it. That's, that's all whenever it's so big and so bad and everybody's just so excited. But I'm going to finish tonight because I'm not done. I should have said that. Now I'm going to have half the crowd. I ain't coming back to here anymore. Listen, if we don't get this, if we don't straighten up those things, we're not going to be able to walk with God. You're not going to be able to get what you need to get. You're not going to be able to walk where you need to walk. You're, your faith is going to continue to seem weak, and your victory is going to continue to seem lost until you get to the point that it doesn't matter, uh, that you don't care about anything other than walking with God and pleasing God and getting into that place where things with God are more important than things of this world.